Good morning, everybody. And uh, it's a privilege to be the first speaker up, I guess, also a bit nerve-wracking. Um, I'd like to start just by highlighting that this is collaborative work, so it seems like a good theme to, to begin on, um, in collaboration with Kirsten Dobbs of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. So what I'm going to do today is try and speak to you a bit about management and theory of management. If we think a bit about what, what management is attempting to do, there's a number of generally clear goals that many managers keep at the back of their minds when they're thinking about management, what it is, what they should be doing. Things like retaining or restoring key uh, elements, system elements and relationships, removing or limiting harmful influences in their systems, retaining a natural variance in, in system drivers, so natural disturbance regimes that organisms are adapted to, regulating human use, uh, ensuring the flow of ecosystem services to people in various ways, and managing risks in human safety. And many of these activities have to be undertaken as a result of distinct decisions or uh, collective agreement of some sort on behalf of society. And generally, there's an accepted wisdom that they need to be undertaken at a similar scale. The management actions need to be undertaken at a similar scale to the scale of the phenomenon that people are trying to manage. So, for example, if you've got a, a, risk, uh, a risk of some sort to people that happens at the scale of a reef, you need to have management actions or responses that are appropriate at the scale of a reef in order to manage that particular um, risk. So what happens when that doesn't occur? <clears throat> the concept of scale mismatches. I'll just read through this definition and then talk you through the figure on the right. So when the scale of environmental variation and the scale of social organization that's responsible for management are aligned such that one or more functions of the social ecological system, that's a linked system of people and nature, are disrupted, or inefficiencies occur, or important components of the system are lost. That's a situation where we can say there's a, there's a scale mismatch. Scale mismatches could be spatial, they could be temporal, so things don't happen quickly enough in one system for the other system to respond to, or they could be more, more to do with function. So if th that's a sort of a cartoon illustration on the right, the situation A shows you what, what you can think of as a matched, um, a matched case where the blue is indicating a social hierarchy. So each, each of those A, B, and C would be people who are managing um, a particular aspect of ecosystems or ecosystem variability. And A, B, C would be the ecosystems. As you know, both of these systems are hierarchically arranged, so you need people thinking about the broad scales. That would be uh, person A thinking about broad scale processes indicated by the ecological A. Or at fine scales, say person C, who's thinking about much finer uh, ecological processes at scale C. Now, from that top left one, where you have what, what I'm depicting as a matched system, you can have several different kinds of mismatch. So at the bottom left here, you've got a case where the, the e ecological variation is actually a little bit broader scale than the scale that the managers are able to um, manipulate the system at or have some impact at. So you've got a case there where it's powerless managers. They, they don't have the necessary jurisdiction, if you like, to manage the necessary ecological processes. At the top right, you've got an, an, an opposite kind of a problem where you have a situation where there's a lot of fine-scale variation, and you may have uh, managers who essentially have nothing to do or that their role is unclear. And that can lead to different kinds of problem in the social situation. People get bored, they may cause trouble, there may be overlap of, of jurisdictions, who's doing what. And then at the bottom right there, you have a situation where a lot of management is focused on one part of the ecosystem, and then there's another whole chunk of things that are unmanaged that may be quite important. So this is just an example to help you think about scale and, and, and what I'm talking about when I talk about a scale mismatch. So now, linking this into coral reefs, as we know, the reef is in crisis, as we understand it. These are figures from a paper published in 2019 by a whole group of researchers from, from the center. The bottom left here shows you the global context, so global population increase, uh, GDP per capita has been increasing. What's happened to coral cover in the meantime? That's the GBR, the green line, and the blue line is what's happened in the Caribbean from 1960 to roughly the present. So this is the situation we face. On the far right there are just some pictures of, of coral reefs in different states. The figure in the middle shows you uh, at the top that's a, a space and time plot, so it's the scale on the x-axis in space and the scale on the y-axis in time. And in the 1980s, the, the, the problem basically encompassed that brown shaded area. And the green area in the middle was the area in which most of the responses occurred. What we've got now, if you look at the bottom, is a, is a situation where the nature of the threats has expanded into that red area. 
right? And the, and the responses have broadened a bit, but not nearly as much as entering into that red area. And there's also some new responses at even finer spatial and temporal scales. So what does this mean if we think about this in terms of scale mismatches? Well, managing up, managing those very broad scale issues is, is, is vitally important. It's not something that the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority has the ability to do. But what I'd like to focus on is essentially that brown area for the rest of the talk and see if we can ask the question, is the reef being managed at appropriate scales and how could we tell that? So how could we actually measure that? So this idea of scale mismatches, it's widely used. It's been, been quite highly cited, but it hasn't really been rigorously tested beyond people using it in a kind of a conceptual domain saying, oh, we've got one or two different scales here and something's not quite right in how they're matching up. So I asked, here I wanted to ask, can, can it be useful beyond simply being a conceptual tool? And the Great Barrier Reef obviously offers a data-rich case study. So we wanted to ask, what are the scales of management? What are some of the scales of ecological variation, or at least the scales at which ecological features occur? And how do they align? Are they matched? What, what can we tell about scale mismatches on the GBR? So working together with Kirsten, we, we've uh, extracted data from the permits database from the GBR from 2007 to 2017. So it's a, roughly a 10-year time frame. One permit may give someone several different permissions. So you might have an, an overall permit, and then on, listed on that permit, there's several different kinds of things you're allowed to do. So what we've done is, is deal with the data by permission rather than by permit. So there's 10,300 individual permissions that were issued over that time period. Some of them are valid beyond this time period, and I'll show you a, a figure about how they've been changing in time in a moment. So we were able to, to link just over 10,000 of these to specific locations using existing GIS data layers. In other words, every one of those permissions we've been able to tie to a polygon, saying this is the area in space that that permission refers to. And we also have the time frame over which that particular permission is valid. Then we've aggregated those uh, into 45 minor classes, and then from there into six major classes, which is the units that I'm using to think about the problem in. We can measure, uh, because we've been able to map them, we can measure the size of every polygon by permission type, and then uh, run a comparable, comparative analysis for uh, ecological features, which are also reasonably well mapped in the GBR. And then look at, uh, I've looked at scales, trying to pick out scales using Gaussian mixture models, which I'm not going to go into in huge detail here. This is what happens with permit numbers over time. So keep in mind that this, the zero there is actually the point when, the, when, the, when Gabrumpa started to capture um, electronic data in their permit system. Before that, it was manual. So it doesn't mean that there were no permits here. It simply means that's when the electronic database started. And as you can see, the number of permits has been in increasing exponentially through time. Up to 2017, the expected trend would obviously be still way up. That lag on the other side you can see the red line here indicates when we got the data. The lag on the other side is what happens if you didn't issue any more permits. All of these permits gradually expire. So there's quite a lot of latency in the system. It would take until about 2034. Even if you stopped issuing permits today, well, it would be a couple of years more now. So 2035 or 2036 would be roughly the point where uh, the last currently issued permit would expire on the GBR. So there's a, there's a level of responsiveness here, but there's also a level at which the system is unresponsive to change because it's quite hard to revoke a permit unless somebody has, um, has undertaken something illegal or uh, abused a permit. Right, so we group them into these six major classes, which I'll run through very quickly. So there's commercial resource extraction, educational research. Many of you have probably applied for these kinds of permits. Non-extractive tourism and special events. Access and transport permits. Built infrastructure permits, so if you want to put something on the reef and then pest removal, <coughs> which is the smallest and probably least applied for a category of permits. This is, what, uh, this is a separate exercise where we map these permits out in space, but it gives you an idea of what the data look like in space. So this is a two by two kilometer grid, that's the resolution of what you're looking at, and we've extracted the number of permissions of different kinds within every one of those two by two kilometer grid cells over the entire reef. So this is resource extraction. The numbers here you won't be able to read very easily, but this is ranging from roughly 10 till up to about 120, the maximum. Research and education permits, you can see it gets up to about 50 per grid cell. And then tourism and, and events gets up to about 350. Now the big one uh, in terms of numbers is access. So in some cases there's up to 12, uh, 1200, 1250 permits per square kilometer in some parts of the GBR, particularly this intensive area down near the Whitsundays. 
Uh, infrastructure permits are also uh, goes up to about 80 or 90 per, per degree cell, and pest control is a, is a smaller category. We've done some other analyses, which I'm not going to go into detail on now, showing that access is one of the key things. So obviously you have to have access before you can undertake various other activities, and that's partly why some of the access permits are, are so numerous. So moving on now to think more explicitly about scale, we looked first at the different base layers that we had to use in order to uh, extract the necessary data. This uh, figure on the left shows you, it's a log scale at the bottom, shows you the different coverages we had to use. So although people think in terms of the zonation plan for the reef when they think about how it's managed, in fact there's these many different coverages that are used. It's actually 19 or 20 different data layers that are used to assign permits to, to places in space. And that on the right is our null hypothesis. So those, those are curves fitted using uh, Gaussian mixture models. And you can see that the dominant scales in these data, that's just looking at all the polygons in the data, are at 0.03 and 3.3 kilometers. So if permits were simply assigned at random, that's the pattern you would expect. That's our null model, our counterfactual. So looking at the actual data in the, in the permit database, you can see that they're, they're very far from random. So Permits in the GBR are assigned at two, essentially at two different scales. There's a median at 16 and another median at 100 square kilometers in terms of the areas. They're very significantly different from null, so there's intentionality clearly obvious in the system. Management as implemented under the GB, on the GBR under Gabrumpo, these permits thus occur at two dominant scales. Obviously, the permits don't directly tell you about the scale at which the reef is being used, um, and we don't have data on that, but this is a reasonable surrogate I think, in terms of how people are managing and thinking about the reef. Now, this is perhaps the single most, uh, I think, most interesting figure in this whole presentation. So I'm going to dwell on it, and I'm getting quite near the end. Um, so this shows you on the, on the y-axis the area of all the different kinds of permits. What we've done is, because mo nearly all of them were, were bimodal, we've got a lower and an upper um, uh, peak, like in the figures I just showed you. So what we've done is label the upper peak with a U. You can see many of them on the right there. And then the lower peak with an L. So you might see the same kind of permit appear twice on the, on the x-axis. So the blue, the blue data here refer to all permissions. If you just look at all permissions, there's basically these two scales. And those correspond to the figure I showed you a moment ago with the two different curves on. The yellow is the different kinds of permission by type. So these are mainly bimodal. And some of them are occurring at essentially the scale of the whole GBR on their, or, or, or close to it on their upper limit, and at finer scales at, at lower limits. And then the green, the, the green bars here are the scales of ecological features. So what we included in this, because it's really a fairly preliminary analysis, there's a whole lot of stuff obviously that one could measure about ecosystems. What we've included in this is, uh, is bioregions, the marine bioregions, and then the features that kind of define the reef, the reefs themselves, islands, pieces of rock, and the, the major biophysical features that we can map in the GBR. And there's two, essentially two take-home points from this. Firstly is that the ecological scales are quite a bit smaller than the scales of management. And that's interesting, and I'll get back to why that's really interesting in a moment. The other thing that's interesting here is that there's different scales for different types of permission. So what this suggests is it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of management approach, that there's actually a, some kind of match here between the scales at which uh, ecosystems vary, the scales at which that triggers um, demand for things like access, and then the response of the management agency. So to me, that's a good sign, and that's like a fingerprint of some kind of adaptation or some kind of responsive process going on. All right, so, so what, what can we say about this? It's possible to quantify social institutional scales, and this is, as far as I'm aware, the first demonstration of this approach. So it might seem like a relatively uh, early stage analysis, but it's actually something brand new. Um, ecological scales appear to be finer than management scales. So what does this mean? It actually means that perhaps we need to rethink this idea of scale mismatches and how it's applied. If you think about it, managing at broader scales than the ecological features gives a manager more options and potentially a higher ability to adapt. So if you imagine, for example, as a researcher, you might want to collect a few pieces of coral to do some kind of molecular analysis on. If you had to apply for a permit at the scale you collect at, you would have to have thousands of permits, right? Because you would need a permit for every little piece of coral that you might possibly want to snap a piece off. Whereas if you can apply at the scale of the entire reef, it removes a lot of that inefficiency from the system, and then you can simply search within that area and find the exact thing you need. So 
using that as an example, I think what we may actually be seeing here is not, it's not a scale mismatch situation. It's rather that the theory that says scales should be aligned uh, more or less identically is not quite right. Perhaps we actually need, need a, a new hypothesis. And we're proposing this. We've got a paper under review at the moment, so I'm curious to see what reviewers make about it. But it might mean that we need to rethink some of these ideas about scale mismatches. So is, the, is uh, management of the Great Barrier Reef scale matched? Well, as this shows, diagnosis is really dif difficult. So what we need is more examples. We need, ideally, we need examples from systems where it's widely known, widely agreed that management is really not working. And then we could perhaps compare them to this, which I, th I think is a, is a really well-managed system at this scale. Uh, and we might be able to get some light on what the methods can and can't tell us. The scales of perturbations are also critical to understanding management, and we don't have data on that, so that's an obvious next step. All right, so inclusion, ac access is vital. The permits are, access permits are a surrogate for other types. As the, as the reef changes, the potential for scale mismatches between permits and activities is going to increase, and between dif different elements of social ecological systems on the reef. So, and we don't know if these patterns are stable or if they're undergoing rapid change. So the permit and monitoring data, I think, is an, an underused, uh, partly ignored data source, but it's got the potential where if you could use a kind of real-time analysis of permits, you might be able to set up a system where you could use that to pick up early warning signals of transitions or big changes in the GBR, and particularly in the, in the way it's being managed. So thank you.